Hello. All right. It's the largest crowd ever for a tough finale, first of all. Um, we had 6,500 in attendance. The gate was 531,000. Um, the fight of the night was uh, Tershawn and, and Issa. Performance of the night, Issa. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He won $100,000. Congratulations. I love it. I love when that happens. Um, <clears throat> let's see. What else do I got? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Mark. Martin's won the other one. Yeah. So he wins $50,000. Thank you. I'm on my last leg, boys. I'm about to drop dead, so bear with me tonight. Um, so let me go through the bonuses for the fight of the season. Um, fight of the season uh, was uh, Spawn versus Matt Van Buren. They win $25,000 each. Congratulations to them. And then uh, performance of the season, both of the performance of the seasons go to uh, Diego Lima. So he wins $50,000 for, uh, for that season. So congratulations to those guys. Um, everybody's here. Uh, BJ's getting stitched up. And then he'll be here in a minute. First question, raise your hand. They'll bring you the mic. Dana, couldn't help but notice you had to get up and leave your seat cage side during the main event. I just wonder if you could talk about kind of what was going through your head at that point and kind of what it felt like to watch the main event unfold tonight. Yeah, um, everybody knows where I was and how I felt and what I wanted. Um, BJ Penn is, is a guy who I get to this point where, where I understand it and I get it. You know, the fans go crazy on me when I want guys to retire. But BJ Penn is a guy that uh, – you know, he's been BJ Penn was our jiu-jitsu coach before we even bought the UFC. You know, so I've known this guy forever. He's one of two people who's won two titles in two different weight classes. He built the 155-pound division. He's a legend. He helped build the UFC. Um, and the list goes on and on of what BJ Penn has done. I've said this a million times. He's got a beautiful wife. He's got beautiful kids. He's got a great family. He owns a UFC BJ Penn gym in Hawaii. What more do you want, BJ? There's nothing left to prove. Fighting is a young man's sport. And uh, um, guess what? Matt Hughes could still fight in the UFC. And so could Chuck Liddell and so could Forrest Griffin. I don't want to make one dollar of that kind of money. And he was brutally honest. I mean, he said in there that he felt he shouldn't have been in there tonight. Do you think there's any danger at all that you're going to hear from him again a year from now, 18 months from now, and saying, Dana, please give me one more chance? I'm going to hear so many crazy things from BJ Penn over the next 10 years. Um, but that's part of the fun of BJ Penn. Um, and, you know, what I will do is, like we've always done, me, him, and his family will sit down and we'll talk and, you know, figure this thing out. I guess but, was you know, and, and the other thing that, that, that BJ, that makes BJ BJ is, BJ just didn't say, hey, I want another fight. BJ goes after the number three ranked guy in the world, like one of the baddest dudes on the planet. You know, BJ didn't just like, want another fight. He went after a monster, you know? And Frankie, if we could get your thoughts. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm sure during the course of a fight, you can't be thinking about here I am, you know, possibly beating this MMA legend into retirement. You've got to get the job done. But I guess in retrospect, it's just kind of a somber mood tonight. You know, does, does, does that translate over to you at all? I mean, is it kind of bittersweet for you at all that kind of seeing him walk away or do you just enjoy another victory? No, you know, I, I kind of said that myself. Uh, I felt that as, uh, you know, the finish was going on, it was bittersweet. I didn't get up and celebrate like crazy kind of because I maybe because I just felt like I, that, that was what's, what was going to happen. You know, uh, BJ's will always be uh, mentioned with my name just because we fought three times and, you know, I got the, I got the title from him and, you know, um, when I first got into the sport, BJ was, was the guy, you know, and he did a lot for the lightweight. So I think we all owe BJ a lot. Uh, Dana, you referenced, you know, you didn't want to fight in the first place. Do you regret making it, you know, when he called you saying, hey, dude, you, you're not capable of doing this and you're <clears throat> fighting off too much, you can chew? No. Why I'd, not? Regret, I'd regret it if I made another one. <laughs> not this one. It's At the end of the day, he's BJ Penn. He he wanted to come back. He want, I mean – when I called Frankie, it wasn't like Frankie didn't go, what? Are you kidding me? Are you crazy? He's the number three ranked guy in the world. He's like, yeah, I'll give BJ another shot. I'll fight him again. I mean, we're talking about BJ Penn. It's not like we're talking about, you know, some crazy guy coming out of nowhere and saying, hey, I want to fight Frankie Edgar. 
Um, you know, BJ's, BJ's got an un- – listen to the crowd tonight. Listen, look at the most attended uh, – you know? And listen, boys, you delivered. You did it. But let me tell you what. People weren't flocking to see the finale of the Ultimate Fighter Season 19. Okay? Right. They weren't flocking in droves because that season was so successful and the fights were amazing. They were coming in because BJ Penn was fighting again against the number three, you know, badass monster, Frankie Edgar. That's why people were flocking. The, you know, the other question I have for you is it, you know, it drove you crazy during his career when he said he wanted to win all the titles and, you know, keep moving up and wait and doing that. But isn't that what made him so beloved by a lot of the fans? Because he was willing to do anything and challenge himself beyond what most other fighters were willing to do. The one thing that I've learned in my however many years in the fight business is people love real fighters. People love guys who love to fight. You know, one, one of the most famous, most beloved fighters of all time, Chuck Liddell. You know, Chuck Liddell would fight with me about fighting. You know, he, 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 he would do it for free in a backyard. He would do it anywhere, and he would fight anybody, and that's why people loved him. Arturo Gatti was one of the most beloved fighters. I mean, if you look at all the guys that people really love as fighters, they're guys who love to fight. And uh, B.J. Penn is one of those guys. B.J. Penn was so fun to watch, and he would say crazy stuff. You know, when, when B.J. Penn ruled the world, man, the phone calls that I would get on a weekly basis was just mind-boggling. Is he a guy that, you know, we, you mentioned Forrest and Chuck and some of those guys, they have jobs with the UFC. Would you kind of give him some kind of BJ a does. You know, no-show B- job type yeah, thing? Yeah, B.J. does. B.J., you know, we did a, we did a, a, a UFC gym with B.J., you know? That's no joke. BJ's a partner in that thing, and, and it's, it's kicking ass. The gym, though, might be like an inducement to, you know, he's working out and teaching somebody else, right, and, you know, an inducement to come back. He comes you know, in, shakes hands, kisses babies, and walks around the gym and then leaves. You know, it's not like he's in there uh, training people and scrubbing the floors and, you know, cleaning the mirrors. Oh, BJ's and, doing all right. And then one, two other questions, one for Frankie and one for you. Uh, do you see Frankie getting another title shot at featherweight, and uh, would you would you even consider, I know it's quick, to put him against uh, Mendez in uh, August? Yeah. Um, you know, um, <clears throat> Aldo's going to be out 45 days. The Mendez-Aldo fight can still happen. Um, and then I got I to gotta, I gotta call Frankie Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday and – see where he's at and what he's thinking, what he wants to do. And, Frank, can you just talk about your thought? I mean, uh, obviously, uh, you know, you said in the ring you wanted to fight for a title again. I mean, would you, you know, are you ready for that to be your next fight if you got the winner of Aldo and Mendes? You know, Dana says within they fight in 45 days. Uh, for sure. <clears throat> for sure I'd fight the winner uh, of that fight. Um, I've jumped to it. Frankie, obviously you fought uh, BJ on two other occasions. The first one was close. Second one wasn't so close. This one obviously is very dominant. Can you talk about those three performances? What you saw to BJ? What changes you saw to BJ in those three fights? Uh, I'm, I don't know if so much with the change I saw on BJ. I think it's changed I saw myself. You know, the first time I fought him, uh, I was kind of, you know, uh, I guess uh, wet behind the ears. You know, he was BJ Penn. Uh, you know, I, I believed I could beat him, but uh, you know, then I beat him the first time. The second time, I knew I could beat him. And then this time, I feel like I, I, I was the man. I was the one that was supposed to win. So you know, I went and did it. Uh, you know, dominantly. I know you said before the fight you wanted to finish BJ. You went out there and did it. But we saw a, a variety of things from you tonight. Obviously, your boxing has been a big point of contention, but your wrestling, your ground and pound, you know, maybe a little bit more aggressive with that. Can you just talk about your progression in that and, and how dominant you were, how one side of a fight that really was. You know, I, I'm just always trying to get better in all areas, and I feel like uh, I feel like I still have room to grow. And um, uh, that's a scary thing. You know, I'm, I'm in the gym all the time, and I, you know, I had I had a year off since I fought, but. Uh, I didn't take any time off. I really didn't. You know, um, sometimes I don't know how good it is for my body, but I can't. I can't stay out of the gym. I know you clarified numerous times when somebody said, you know, you said you wanted to retire BJ, and you said I never said that. But now that it's over, it seems like BJ is calling it a career. I mean, what does it mean to you to to you know be that guy and also have that that rivalry so much that he wanted to come back just to face you again? You know, I get it. Like like Dana was talking about, BJ is just just a fighter. You know, he wanted that redemption and. Uh, you know, he's a guy, uh, I'm the guy that he felt he can get it back at. But, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not looking as I retired BJ. I think if, if you know, who knows if he won or anything. I heard him saying that he was talking about, you know, one fight and retiring. Or, or if it was a different guy, he may have retired. So, uh, you know, I'm not that guy. I just wanted to go and get the job done tonight. And a question for uh, Eddie Gordon. 
Eddie, you uh, you went on the Ultimate Fighter, and you guys obviously took a lot of criticism for your performances on the show, but you came out there and really put on a dominant performance. Uh, what was it like going in there tonight? And, and was that in the back of your mind, you know, hearing this over the last, you know, 13 weeks that, you know, the show didn't show up and the fights didn't show up and you and Corey both went out there and completely revamped any thoughts maybe anyone had on that show? Dana White is good at what he do. You know, he's an ultimate motivator. Um, I'm very self-motivated. I didn't go in there tonight thinking I need to do this, I need to do that. I just wanted to be who I was and the fighter that I continually grow with. And it meant a lot. I felt as comfortable in that cage as ever. You know, the show, it's a grind, man. You don't get to see everything. It's tough on your body. I'm not, I'm not the smallest 85 pounder, so making weight that many times, but it is what it is. Fighting's fighting. It all made me a better fighter, and it was able to showcase my abilities today. There's much more to come. And a quick question for Corey Anderson. Corey, I know, you know, we talked a lot this season, and you had said that, you know, when you started the show, you'd been training for, about, I think, about a year and a half at that point. Very, very young in the sport. You took, obviously, about nine months between the show filming and now. We saw tremendous improvement in your hands. I know you work with Frank and his coaches a lot. Uh, what was it like stepping in there, and do you feel like this was a, a real showcase of who you're going to be as a fighter now? I mean, you're, you're barely two years into the sport. I think tonight was a showcase of what I can be, but just a start of what I'm going to develop to be. I'm going to get even better, I feel. I'm going to keep going back to Frankie's camp and learning from the great coaches out there and all the great fighters they have. And I continue to grow. I mean, like Mark Henry told me, he says, you got that white belt mentality. And it's true. Every time I go into anything, if I go to wrestling practice and I took second in the country, I'm willing to learn. I'm there to learn anything you can show me. Like you said, I was young. And, yeah, I told Coach when I got there, we, I'm here. I'm a, I'm a dry sponge, and I want you to, to teach me everything you can. I'm going to just keep absorbing and absorbing <clears throat> until we just there's nothing else we can learn. But hopefully I continue to learn every day. <clears throat> I've got a question for Derek. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, your past and, and how, you know, people talk some, no? Oh, okay. Because <laughs> people talk about sometimes how the sport, you know, has changed their life and, and, and saved their life in a way. And would you say that that's the case for you? Yes, I, I truly believe it saved, like, me, my family. The path that I was heading on wasn't the right path. And I believe that's the only way that I could have changed by going into that situation, like going to prison and stuff like that. Because I, I grew up without a father, so tough love was the only thing I knew. At what point did you find the sport? A few months after I got out. Yeah. And Dana, what do you have to say about the idea that he mentioned calling out Matt Mistrione? Obviously, Matt's healthy. Uh, Derek didn't take much damage. Is that a fight you could put together soon? Probably, yeah. <laughs> We'll cool. see what happens, yeah. All right, cool. He's, he's a scary guy, man. Right? Wow. Yeah. See the one he missed? <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Thank you. And Frankie, for you, just just curious how you feel. Obviously, all of your guys were in the finals, and uh, it speaks to what you do as a coach. I'm just curious if you th thought these two would be the ones holding the statues at the end of it all. You know, uh, I'm proud of these guys. They put a, a lot of work in during the during the show, and uh, obviously they put to continue to do so. You know, Corey, I see it on a daily basis. Matt, uh, uh, Eddie trains with Matt and Chris and those guys, and they're they're close to us. So, you know, I know he's going to be well prepared. You know, the cream rises to the top, and, and it did tonight. Great. Okay, and now that BJ, you are here, uh, first, thank you for everything you've done over the years. And obviously people want to know, have you officially decided to stop fighting? Yes, uh, of of course. Uh, this is the end. Um, I'm I'm thinking to myself, why did you why did you step back in the octagon after the beating that Roy McDonald gave you? And uh, the reason is is because I really needed to find out uh, if if I didn't do what ha if if I didn't uh, make this night happen for myself, I would have always wondered and I would have always went back and forth and begged Dana to let me get back in and. Uh, I guess I just, I needed some closure. And you specifically needed closure with Frankie or you just specifically needed one more opportunity in the octagon? Uh, one more octagon, I mean, I, I was, I was going to see how far I could take it. You know, I was going to see what happened when I stepped in with Frankie and then I was going to see where it went from there. If it was a good victory that I could walk away with or if I was still hungry and wanted to do it again. And did you fig 
feel that pretty quickly in the fight that that it wasn't right anymore? Um, well, I definitely when the blood started going all in my eyes and everything, and and the fight started getting real tough. Um, you know, I, I realized uh, it takes a high, high energy level to compete with the top people in the world. It's uh, you know, you could have every technique figured out, you could have this and that, and all your theories ready to go. And at the end of the at the end of the the bottom line is, you need a high energy level to compete against these guys. They're very hungry. They want to be the best. Uh, you know, I can sit here and say a thousand times that the sport passed me by, but it's just there's just such quality people, you know, in the UFC at the moment. Thank you, BJ, in the uh, back here. I was curious if you could reflect for us on what was your best moment, your biggest achievement here in the UFC. Well, I thought you were going to ask me what well, was my best moment tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Walking out, probably. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, my best moment in the UFC, you know, I guess now that I look back, you know, I'm going to have to look at my biggest accomplishment. And, you know, it's it's the two belts and the two weight classes. And I really wanted to see if I could make it three. But, uh, you know, you, you you're talking about the best guys in the world. You know, you look at someone like Frankie Edgar, you think, oh, that little guy, you know, this and that. But, you know, these these guys, they want it. They want it. And even if you're sitting there and you think you figured something out or you got something that you're going to, you know, surprise somebody with, first thing you got to do is have more heart than these guys. And that's what uh, all these people sitting up here right now ha have a lot more. They have that. And you can't see it by looking at them. You can only see it by, by feeling it. And would you say that you have any regrets at this point of anything that maybe you didn't get to accomplish that you had wanted to? The biggest regret would have been is if I didn't get in the ring tonight because I'd always wonder and I'd always kick myself in the butt and I'd always complain to Dana and complain to everybody that, man, I, I could have did it again. And now I know for sure that I can't. Yes, this question for BJ. Uh, BJ, you mentioned a couple of your uh, great accomplishments in the sport. At the end of the day, what do you feel you want the fans and the commentators and those that follow the sport most? What do you want to be most remembered by, and what do you think your lasting legacy is? Uh, mm. My lasting legacy would, you know, my lasting legacy now is just going to be in highlight reels and, you know, Dana gave me an opportunity to work with the UFC gyms and do different things so, you know, I, I can uh, continue to uh, feed myself over, you know. He's one of the best 155-pounders of all time. He built that weight class. <clears throat> he built that weight class, and he was responsible for helping build the UFC. That's his legacy. This question for Frankie. Uh, Frankie, what do you feel like these three fights with BJ Penn have done for your career, and how do you think that this has helped define your legacy in the sport? I mean, uh, just to be, like I said, you know, before, uh, BJ is going to forever be a part of my career. Uh, you know, uh, the upside of my career started with BJ, him giving me the title shot. And, uh, you know, when you have a, you know, two, three fights with a guy, or whenever I'm mentioned, or whenever BJ's mentioned, I feel, you know, the other guy's going to be mentioned. So, uh, you know, I think all lightweights, all little guys, or not even, just everybody in the UFC owes a lot, owes a lot to BJ. Thank you, Edgar. Uh, Frankie, about your game plan tonight, with each of the three fights with BJ, uh, we, we've seen you win in a more convincing fashion, but also it seems like your game plan has opened up. You know, by the second fight, we saw your takedowns being showcased. Tonight, you were jumping in BJ's guard, following him to the ground. Was that part of the game plan going in with each successive fight, your confidence growing, fighting him, or was that just circumstances dictating? I think it's just the develop of my, you know, my skills and, and my, my beliefs in myself. You know, uh, 
you know, um, <clears throat> BJ is a, is a t- was a tough, tough mountain to climb, and uh, you know, it takes it takes confidence and, and belief in yourself to you know keep that getting to the next stage. And I think that just has to do with the time I put in the sport. And uh, question for uh, the Ultimate Fighter winners tonight: uh, Corey Anderson and, and Eddie Gordon. Eddie, to you first, and then if we could go to Corey with the question: Did uh, the two of you? We don't always see all of the storylines on the Ultimate Fighter after editing. Uh, it was a big night for Team Edgar, but did the two of you throughout the course of the season have any particular friendship connection moments together? Because you guys are uh, always going to be associated on this finale with two guys who had spectacular first round knockouts that were 10 seconds apart. Did you guys during the course of the season have any particular uh, bond? Yeah, well, we definitely had a, uh, a tight bond. I'm very outspoken. <laughs> if uh, guys didn't notice that, but um. Corey's great, you know. We had a tight-knit group from the start to finish. You know, I think if you ask any one of our teammates, we were all tight, you know. You probably didn't get to see the bond between me and Corey, but he pushed me. Like, I was a bigger 85-pounder, so I probably trained with Corey just as much as I did with anybody else on the show. He's an awesome wrestler, and he helped me grow a lot, you know. Being able to compete on a high-level guy every single day, he made me a better fighter without a doubt. To you, Corey. I have to second exactly what he said. I mean, we became kind of like brothers. I mean, it was times on the while we was in practice, we get into arguments over little stuff, you know, like little nitpicking stuff, and we were just tired, exhausted, you know, like brothers do. But at the house, we were very close. I mean, as you saw in my semifinal fight, I picked him and gutted the corner me, and I picked Eddie because we just we had worked so much, and he knew me, and it was close. Like if we went for a run, we was doing it together. At first, I mean, we was around the fire every night together, cooking together, hanging out. They just lived on the second floor, and I was on the first, so you didn't get to see much of us. That's but cute. me and Eddie was very close. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, finally to you, Dana, uh, you, you have not been shy about your criticism of uh, this season of The Ultimate Fighter, but tonight, two spectacular first-round knockouts by these guys. Does it take some of the, the sting out of what's been the seeming like the bane of your existence the last couple of months? Yeah, I walked into the octagon after and said, where the hell were you guys all season? <laughs> um, and, yeah, you know what? The, the great thing about fighting is you're only as good as your last fight. You can go in there in one night and change an entire season, and they definitely did that tonight. You want to talk about delivering, man. These guys delivered great fights. <clears throat> Question for Frankie. Uh, I know you haven't fought in a year and you just had a third child. So do you want to come back quickly and, and be more active for the second half of the year or do you want to take some time off now? I want to definitely fight before the year is over. You know, I want to get more than one fight in this year. So, uh, you know, go home, talk to the team and see what's up. But, uh, you know, before the year is over, I'd like to fight for sure. And I know you also said that you wanted a title shot or someone that would get you close to a title shot. If you can't get the title shot, is there someone that is of interest to you? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really not a name caller, but uh, I mean, I, Danny said I'm number three. I thought I was number two. So whoever's number two, I guess, would be good. I don't know what you are. These guys change every friggin' day. Even when guys don't fight, guys get changed in the rankings. Who knows? Uh, would one of you guys give Kevin Howley the mic? You want the mic, Kev? Oh, you're not done yet? Oh, no. okay. I just wanted to know, BJ, are you okay to answer a couple? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just curious how you felt as a featherweight for the first time, and um, did you feel like maybe if you were at 155 or obviously 170 that you could have performed differently? Um, that's that's neither here nor there, you know, Ariel. That's just all speculation at this point. Okay. And um, it seemed from watching you and from watching some of your fights that you changed your stance a little bit, the way you were attacking things specific that you had worked on in this camp? Yeah, you know, I was uh, trying to use uh, some range, some distance, but uh, Frankie mixed it up well, cut some good angles, stayed busy, and, uh, you know, he, he got to me. And finally, uh, do you think you'll stick, you know, stick around in martial arts now that you're not fighting? Do you, do you still want to remain a part of fighting, or do you want to do something completely different now? Um, you know, we'll uh, stick to the UFC gyms at the moment, and uh, you know that's 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 a lot of uh, what I've done my whole life, and a lot of what I know. So uh, it's going to be tough to completely walk away from all that. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. BJ, uh, congratulations on a great career. 
I wonder, you know, talk about your first win over Matt Hughes because that remains one of the, you know, epic fights in UFC history. Do you think in the aftermath of that, if had you stayed in the UFC and not, you know, had the contract dispute gone out, that, you know, you might have accomplished some of those other goals that you set, set up to do, you know, when you were talking about, you know, running the table back in the day? Um, you know, I was, I was uh, thinking about that a few months ago, actually, and, uh, you know, who who knows what what could have been if uh, if you know I I had all those other fights in the UFC and you know it did ca cause a riff uh, for a while and uh, yeah I, it w it would have it would have been interesting to see how everything would have unfolded. And you mentioned in the little video that was played in the arena before the fight that, you know, Frankie was your greatest rival. And, you know, I kind of immediately thought of Hughes and GSP. Uh -huh. And I'm just curious, you know, since you said Frankie's your greatest rival, how, how you characterize those two and your, you know, rivalry with them? Because a lot of people thought, you know, maybe you were the three best welterweights in, uh, of all time, too, or up to that point, you mm -hmm. know. No, uh, w uh, without a doubt, uh, me and uh, Matt and uh, me and George have had a, uh, some uh, legendary uh, clashes together, and um, you know, they were, you know, good. It was, uh, it's just tough, you know. Don't definitely. I think that's what kind of uh, made my career something to watch and to look at is that I did have these different rivals throughout the years, and you know, a fighter, you know, like everybody always. Talked about Roy Jones at the beginning of his career. He never had anybody to fight against, and you know that's 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 what makes a career great to to run into the, all these people. So I was actually you know just blessed to to have these rivalries with with these three people. Um, <clears throat> question for BJ: um, Dana always talks about the guys that have built their careers uh, from a countryside standpoint, meaning like GSP with Canada or you know uh, Cain Velasquez with Mexico. You were a guy that maybe before anybody had an entire state behind them. I mean, the entire state of Hawaii, when I was there, you see BJ Penn billboards. I mean, I've never seen that before in the sport, and that was in 2006. What did it mean to have Hawaii behind you? And the crowd this entire week was insane. I mean, your name gets mentioned. Your video pops up. I mean, again, you're a fighter. I don't know how much that plays into it, but what did that mean to you? It's, it was, it's always uh, been so amazing, the, the support I got. You know, it, it would be the strangest thing. I'd lose a fight, and I'd get... I'd go walk down the road. I couldn't walk down the road, and I'd, I'd say, I'd say, I'm get more famous every time I lose a fight, or, you know, different things. And people just, uh, you know, could connect with me. They, they felt that uh, I was just a normal human being. You know, I, in the off season, I'm overweight, and, you know, I'm just trying my best. Uh, you know, like anybody else. I think, I think the appeal was that. You know, here here he is. He's just a normal guy, just like us, and you know he's giving it his all. And a question for Eddie Gordon: uh, We saw your teammate last night, Chris Weidman, performance, amazing performance. Uh, how much did Chris play into your camp this time, and and training with him at the exact same time that he was getting ready for a title fight? You were 24 hours later. I mean, how much did he play a role in your in your performance tonight? Uh man, it was it was priceless. Like Chris played a a big role in my life. Like I didn't even know about mixed martial arts until I walked into the gym. And he was there. Like, without him, I wouldn't even be here right now. He said, come check this sport out. And I fell in love. You know, it was, it's almost like a gift and a curse. I get to train with the world champion every day. So you take your bumps and bruises along the way. But in reality, it doesn't matter who I go in the cage with because they're not Chris Weidman. So just that advantage that I'm, I get mentally is huge. You know, we push each other, you know, to the limits. And every single day I'm in that gym, I learn something that's invaluable to a fight, you know. Everybody in the UFC is good. If you don't believe in yourself, you know, why should somebody else believe in you? So, you know, he told me just when you're sparring, it doesn't matter who you're sparring with, just push it to the limit, exhaust yourself, and the fight can only get easier. And uh, one last one for Corey. Uh, kind of a follow-up to what I asked Eddie earlier. You know, again, you guys did take you know a lot of criticism this season, you know, for the performance and things, but it seemed like, you know, your development, we saw it start on the show, especially in the fight with Pat Walsh, where you started using your hands more and, and you were developing that jab. Then you come out in this fight, and it was hands and wrestling and, and everything. I mean, 
Uh, do you feel like this is, you know, kind of not necessarily who you are as a fighter or who you're going to be, but but kind of a follow-up to that season? Again, answering that criticism from Dana that, that everybody took on the show. Mm, like I said, it's a, a start of what I can become. That's what I'm thinking. I'm just going to continue to grow, and I'm not going to stick to one thing. I'm going to continue to work things as a mixed martial artist, and I want to learn. Like, yes, my hands are very developed now, and I feel confident with my boxing, and I probably lean a little more to my kicks now. You know, it's just but. I just feel confident that I'm going to keep growing. We'll take one more question. Dana, now that this season of The Ultimate Fighter is wrapped, how pumped up are you about the debut of the strawweight women's division on the next season? <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited. Um, you know, it's like nothing we've ever done before. We've got, we have the top 16 women in the world in that weight class, and it will crown a champion at the end of the season. So it's different. It's exciting. It's new. You know, the, the women go after it. There's already been, you know, the first day when they get in there, there's already been stuff. Half of them don't like each other. It's, you know, it's going to be a very interesting season. Yeah, we heard Felice Herrig almost got thrown off the show on the first day. What's that? We heard Felice Herrig almost got thrown off the show on the first day. Well, no, I wouldn't say that she almost got thrown off, but a fight broke out the first day almost. <laughs> so something to look forward to. Then. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Like I said last night at the press conference, been an un unbelievable week. We really appreciate all your work, and uh, see you at the next one. Thank you. <clears throat>